Bedford. Um, and Pixel Work administers several uh, websites, um, not only in Britain, uh, things like East of England Development Association, uh, Sugar Ray, the boxing company, but also abroad. And one of the websites they run is here at the Explorers Club uh, on East 70th Street here in New York City. Uh, we've got an interview with uh, a fascinating underwater photographer called Anne Dubier. Uh, so we're going to go in and speak to Anne about, about her career and how the Explorers Club helps her. Sort of birthplace of my open water diving was in the Bahamas off Andros Island. And the first time I jumped in that crystal clear turquoise water uh, after growing up in New England and diving in a quarry where you had visibility, which was about half a meter, uh, it was remarkable. And at that time, there were sweeping schools of snappers, red snappers, sweeping across the reefs, golden grunts, uh, huge groupers just darting around on the reef all over the place. And, and so it was just a, a paradise of photography. Now, and I've kept up with my birthplace of open water diving over the years, now it's a completely different place there. There are no more snappers, there are no more grunts, the groupers are pretty much fished out, a lot of the reefs are covered with brown algae, so it's, it's sort of choking all the coral growth. So it's a very different place now than it was then, 30 years ago. And is that a constant theme, that you're travelling around the world and seeing a different place everywhere you go? Well, not everywhere, but certainly enough <clears throat> that it makes one sit up and take notice. Um, particularly, uh, which comes to mind, people always ask me, where's your favourite diving spot? And I usually say the Red Sea 30 years ago, particularly off the coast of the southern Sinai, Ras Muhammad, the tip of the Sinai. And uh, there's been tremendous changes throughout there over the years. Um, when my daughter was a baby, she's now 27 years, when she was just an infant, we were on expedition and assignment for National Geographic many times in the Red Sea. And uh, I remember one time in particular when I was swimming around at dusk under the boat and my new daughter was just a little over a year old swinging comfortably uh, on deck in a beautiful little swing rigged up by the crew in the cool evening, beautiful breezes of the Sinai. And I'm in Alice in Wonderland underneath the boat in the for a virtual forest of soft coral bushes, trees, pinks, purple, lavender, chartreuse, orange, bright yellow, and thinking, I can't wait till my daughter is old enough and I can bring her back here to dive in this very spot. And when she got her license and she was old enough and I went to bring her back there, those corals were all gone. So in, in the course of her lifetime so far on this planet, 27 years, there have been tremendous changes that I've seen in my, my specific dive spots. So, so when you're at, for example, symposiums like in Vail a couple of years ago, is that theme something that comes out time and time again? Yes, I have to say that I had a real aha moment that changed how I view the world. Uh, just a couple of years ago, I was uh, laying out all my pictures, hundreds of pictures that I was putting together for an uh, exhibition at the National Arts Club here in New York that I called Coral and Ice. And uh, as I was laying out hundreds of pictures, uh, of corals that I had taken all over the world over the past 30 years. And recently I had had the opportunity to go to the Arctic and the Antarctic. So I got to see the magnificent ice. I didn't dive there yet, maybe someday, but um, just walking around in that magnificent light and silence on those remote poles of the earth is, is quite a, a life altering experience. Anyway, when I was laying out all my pictures on the light box to sort of pair up uh, I had this idea of doing an over-under um, and uh, with, with an iceberg on the top and a coral underneath to just sort of show uh, the top of the world and the underneath part of the world. And as I was laying out all these pictures, I realized that every single picture of an iceberg that I took was melting, drip, drip, dripping and melting. And most of the corals that I had photographed were all gone, disappeared. So that was a real aha moment for me. Without getting too, too um, uh, messianic, so to speak, or missionary, what, what can one do about it? Well, this is a very interesting question because people also ask me that all the time. And as an individual, for a long time I couldn't answer that question because I was really depressed and upset and horrified. 
Um, but as, an in, as individuals, and this sounds ridiculous, but in our daily life, because I'm a very practical person, don't use any more plastics. Don't use any more plastic bags. Don't use any more plastic water bottles. Uh, no more plastics in the ocean. The ocean is drowning and choking with plastic refuse and waste. Um, another thing is to, to become active in whatever way you can in your local government. Um, for me, the first time in my life, I actually went to Washington, D.C. Uh, last spring and went lobbying with a group for, uh, to pass clean ocean action on, um, uh, to get through our Congress. Um, so you can become political in whatever level that you want. And I think that the other thing is to just educate people and in whatever way we can about what's happening in the oceans. It's really, we can stop it. We can help, but we can't let it go on the way it's been going on with throwing our plastic and our sewerage and our refuse and overfishing the way we have. So when you started, was it a woman in a man's world and is it still a woman's in a man's world? That it was very much uh, a, a boy's world and I was the only girl in my uh, diving class and I thought, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to get through this? But I did, I persevered. Um, now it's very different. It's, the diving world is at least 50 to 60 percent female worldwide. So, uh, and also interestingly, women make better divers physiologically than men because we have a little more body fat. And so we stay warmer longer, which means you use less air less quickly and you're more relaxed when you're warm rather than when you're cold. You sit here to the Explorers Club. In some ways it feels like a step back in time. But what have been the benefits to you of being a member of the Explorers Club? Yes, it's very, very historical feeling here in headquarters. And um, it is a lot of ways stepping back in time, but I love history because it really, history really connects you, connects the past to the present. And uh, certainly uh, sometimes walking around in here with all the uh, artifacts and, and knowing who went before, walked through these rooms and sat here, uh, it's very inspiring. And uh, I would say probably that the biggest, I've always said that the biggest asset of the Explorers Club is its membership worldwide. And it is a worldwide organization. I mean, the New York headquarters is, is awe-inspiring to just sort of walk around and, and see everything that's in here. But it's the people all over the world. And being a member of the Explorers Club connects you up with a network of like-minded individuals, explorers, people who get it, people who get excited just to go out into their own backyard and see how you can grow tomatoes and what happens. You know, it's not just about having to go to the end of the earth. It's, 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 a, it's a way of thinking about your daily life, wherever you are. And that's an interesting final point to make, isn't it? I think I sent you the quote from Socrates about the unexamined life is not worth living, but it's not necessarily about going to the far ends of the earth. No, absolutely not. And I think that as human beings, probably one of the hardest concepts we have to think about and accept is change. And everything changes. The only thing that doesn't change is change. And when you extrapolate and take that and apply it to our planet, it's changing drastically, which is very hard to accept and understand. Uh, I think there, there are natural changes, uh, there are changes in cycles in nature that are natural. I think that the hardest thing for us to come to terms with now is the effect that human interaction is having on those natural cycles. And as human beings, we have to be so careful of what we're putting out into the planet because even though these incredible uh, beaches, uh, like I was off the coast of Maine a while ago on this little deserted island, stretching endlessly, millions and millions and millions of, of shells, of, of mussel shells just lying there. And I thought, you know, this seems so permanent, so infinite, so immutable, but in fact that's not at all the case. The, the earth is changing, our planet is changing, and our interaction with it has to change to preserve it. And thank you very much. Thank you. A pleasure.